this one, pass that down so you have extra mics down there. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm going to introduce the panelists, but just for a second before I do. Uh, unfortunately, Brandon went to get something and his car broke down, so um, he will not be joining us. But he has a company called Payment Love, and he does something similar to credit card payments. And I, on behalf of, of the chamber, want to thank him for providing the drinks. Let me, let me take a minute to introduce our panelists to you, and then we will launch with questions. Sitting immediately next to me is George Koo. George was the founder of International Strategic Alliances, a cross-border advisory firm assisting U.S. high-tech companies in Asia. While at Deloitte, he was a senior advisor in the Chinese Services Group and on the board of directors of Las Vegas Sands. That sounds like so much fun. You're going to have to tell us something about that one. Um, he, uh, I lost my place, I started laughing. Currently on the board of Fresh Fields, a startup offering green energy building platforms. He's helping the company introduce their technology in China. So he should have some interesting things to say. Sitting next to him is Leslie Levy August. Leslie has over 25 years of experience helping importers and exporters save money and ease customs clearance when shipping product samples, professional and trade show equipment abroad. Most recently, she specialized in the International Temporary Export Document, which is called the ATA CARNET, C-A-R-N-E-T, and it's a merchandise passport, which I never knew we needed to have. And, uh, and UK exporters, so both American and UK exporters, to ensure their products and equipment are shipped and returned to their point of origin without duty or import tax. Her company is called Boomerang Carnets. Get it? Goes, comes back. Carnets, very clever. Uh, whose customers represent a broad range of exporters and importers across the globe. Leslie's a blogger, authors the Exportees, not expert, but Exportees newsletter, uh, and serves on the board of several nonprofit trade education organizations. And Leslie has left some of her literature on the back table, as have I. And anybody else is welcome to, to leave there if they want. Sitting next to Leslie is somebody that I hold in very high esteem, not that I don't hold everybody else in it, but I just really love this guy. And that's, and you'll, you'll know why once he starts talking. That's <laughs> Michael Condry. He's currently the chair of the advisory board for Clinic Al, a biomed startup company. And he was telling me a little bit about what they're doing outside, and I think I'll share a little with you. His career spans both academic and industry positions. He's held senior leadership roles in Intel, Sun, AT&T, and Bell Labs. My ex-husband worked for Bell Labs. You probably, you probably managed him. Everybody worked for Bell Labs. <laughs> That's how everybody started. Most recently, Michael was the CTO in the client division of Intel. He also held teaching positions at Princeton and the University of Chicago. He's currently president of the IEEE Technology and Engineering Management Society, which calls itself TEMS, and is a senior board member of the IEEE Electronics Society, and he chairs the IEEE Industry Forum. And that's Michael. Sitting next to Michael is Abby Gingold. Uh, Abby has held various executive positions in international sales, business development, and marketing. And he's been with Israeli high-tech companies as well as companies here in the United States. As the director of sales and marketing for Radwiz, is that pronounced correctly? For Radwiz, he helped position them for acquisition by Terion Communications in the United States. And Abby is also a uh, current and active member of the Chamber of Commerce. And then um, at the far side is Bruce Lefetre. Uh, Bruce approaches marketing from the angle of the customer's perspective. I love the way he does it. He flips, he kind of flips the traditional way we do marketing around to say, you know, what does the customer want? Which is a strange concept. Um, he uncovers what the customer thinks, wants, and values, enabling the company to focus on improving the customer's business rather than selling products and services. He gained his perspective by interviewing hundreds of B2B customers. So he's got a lot of interesting things, and I think a lot of what he's going to offer us will help small businesses as well as big businesses. 
His work creates a long-term outlook and business-wide perspective that naturally aligns marketing, sales, operations, and finance. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your panel. And I'm gonna start off with a soft question to give the panel time to kind of let us get to know them on a personal level. So my first question to each of you is, when and how did you start marketing to other countries? And what made you interested in tackling this issue? And then what countries have you marketed to? So why don't I start, Bruce, on your end. Okay. Um, really, I work with clients mostly that are here, but they can be anywhere in the world and have, have customers or clients throughout the world. And from that standpoint, it's <clears throat> how are those customers unique to, to their uh, offering uh, as opposed to just big broad brush of they're in Germany or they're in France or they're in Japan. Uh, if you look at even in the U.S., customers aren't the same. And you don't say, well, they're from the U.S. or they're from California. We're Avi and I were talking about just his experience with regional differences. And that's, <clears throat> if you want to connect with people, you need to go to where they are and how they think. And when you do that, the perspective opens up. And so I work with both uh, clients that are in the U.S., but also clients that are looking to go to other parts of the world or have customers or clients in other parts of the world as well because it's kind of a, it's a basic fundamental that, uh, that works everywhere. So my background is a technical background, and uh, in 1993, I got um, coming back from the States after finishing a three years contract with an Israeli company, uh, I um, joined a startup in Israel, and that was my first position in sales and marketing. And because Israel is a very small state, most of the tech startup, their international, their sales are basically international. So I found myself getting involved with international travel and international sales, and it wasn't my choice. I just got into that, and I liked it very much. I, I've got one. Thank you very much. Um, well, at, at Intel, uh, of course, Intel's products are sold worldwide, all over the world. Uh, but those are products based on Intel technology. Intel's primary customers are the um, o OEMs and ODMs that uh, build the servers, build the clients, uh, uh, and they mostly are, are focused in um, China and Taiwan. Uh, with some in other regions, including Europe, but the primary developers are focused in that area. Uh, and it was stated earlier, if you want to address issues, you want to, you want to work with people, you have to go there, you have to understand other cultures and their rules, and you have to engage all the way from eating their food to respecting their, their, their beliefs and respecting their, their criteria and, and relationships are very critical, particularly in China, uh, but worldwide, uh, how you build a relationship with a customer can often do a lot more than just cutting your price or having a good marketing campaign. Your markets can be driven around the nature of relationships to other business. Thank you, Michael. Before, Leslie, before you went, you know, I, something you said resonated that I want, I want to make a comment. Learning how to respect the traditions and customs of other countries is so important. I, I took my niece to Africa on safari a couple of years ago, and, uh, and I don't do anything cheaply. You know, if I'm gonna do it, I spend a lot of money. So we're at this wonderful place that we stopped at, and there's a lineup of people waiting to take our luggage. And uh, instead of handing off our luggage, my niece says, I can carry my own. And I mutter under my breath, give her your luggage. <laughs> so I can carry my own. And you're insulting other people. They're waiting there. It's their job to take your luggage. And I, I, she obviously listened to me at some point. But to you know, not plug into those kind of little things gets you in so much trouble. So I, mean, just, I, I just wanted to underscore what you said there. Leslie? Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. I guess it still is. Um, so we are a small, privately owned, for-profit company in the service space. Um, and we've been in business uh, over 25 years. And about five years ago, 
four or five years ago, we decided to actually establish our company overseas in the UK. Um, and it was a very, very challenging process. And the reason we didn't do it sooner is because we operate in a highly regulated uh, business space. So we are regulated by the insurance industry. We're regulated by the International Chamber of Commerce. It's very difficult to navigate out of doing business in the US because of the high level of regulation. But we figured out a way to do it. And like I said, about four years ago, we opened up our company in the UK. Um, and we picked the UK for some very specific reasons, which I'm guessing we'll get into later in the panel. Um, but I just want to give a plug for small businesses being able to expand internationally, even in business or in industries where it may seem like there are just overwhelming challenges from a regula regulatory perspective. And you know, we're an example of it can be done, um, and we're doing it very successfully right now. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I, I, used, I used to be an engineer, but I never learned how to spell it, so I, <laughs> then I turned to uh, helping American technology companies in, in Asia. Um, a lot of things have already been said, but I, I would like to forgive me to make one Please. digression. Have any of you had prunes for breakfast this morning? No. <laughs> Do you know what prunes is? Yes. Well, in the old days, you eat prunes because if you're constipated, it's supposed to help you. <coughs> and besides, there's this very uncomplimentary expression. Oh, she's as dried up, she's as winkle as a dried up prune, et cetera. So guess what? I went to Costco the other day to buy a big package, and it's called Probiotic Sun Dry Plums. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if the next edition is organic <laughs> and gluten free. <laughs> so, but that makes Bruce's point, doesn't it? <laughs> so, 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 what's my point? That's marketing, folks. Okay? And not only that was marketing, it's marketing in keeping with the times. Because if you're going to cater to the millennials in this era, they wouldn't, they wouldn't care anything about prunes, but they care about probiotics and pro organic, et cetera, et cetera. So keep that in mind when we, when we discuss. I just want to say one thing. I, my specialization, is, as you heard from my intro, is really about Asia, especially about China. And I have to tell you, given the stuff that's going on between Washington and Beijing, this is probably the best time to think about selling to China. Yeah. Because they're predisposed to buy, to try to even up this quote unquote trade imbalance. They, they try to continue the message on globalization. So think about China. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, was, I was up at Oracle a number of years ago. And I was talking to the senior vice president of marketing at Oracle. Um, and she used a phrase that really resonated with me. She said that uh, the significant part of her responsibility was to keep the marketing people from all over the country within the landscape of Oracle. So there was the bigger picture Oracle, and then there were the specifics country to country. So my next couple of questions, and you you know, volunteer to answer them, really have to do with that picture in my head. So what in particular did you feature in each of the countries that you were involved with? How did you differ, it's all one question, how did you differentiate from country to country? Uh, and how do you describe the need to those working with you or for you? Who wants to tackle that? I can, I You're can, passing I, the mic around. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I had employees um, all the way from Israel, some in Europe, many in the United States, um, and then, of course, about 125 in Taiwan and about another 100 in China. And um, you, you, you have to, uh, I said earlier, you have to respect the different cultures. I mean, I go to China and I love the food. I go to Israel and I hate the food, but I still eat it. Yeah, I know you're insulted. <laughs> uh, but um, 
but I, I, you know, I will tell that to this committee. But that doesn't mean that you don't engage with the groups. Um, and uh, respect of people's culture is very, very critical to get it out. One thing I did at Intel, which was actually surprisingly drastic change, was that I noticed that the process of evaluation and promotion in Intel was very much focused on the United States. And um, I, I, I said, you know, this is wrong. People, particularly in, in Taiwan and China, are the ones that are helping our customers build product. And some of them are doing extremely inventive things to make that happen. So I went all the way to the top to restructure the methodology that Intel uses to evaluate so that our field engineers, not salesmen, engineers that go out there, hold hands with Lenovo, hold hands with Asus, and get their product out the door and invent things that make them get their product out the door better because they understand that customer, what that customer needs, and they don't necessarily understand that here back in Silicon Valley or up in, particularly up in Oregon. They're a little bit isolated from that. So utilizing that resource, A, we solved some very major critical problems that Intel was having with some of its processors by using the invention of the field. B, we restructured the reward system outside of the United States so that we were promoting people from engineer to senior engineer to PE out in the field because they impacted the product, not just designed the super chip, but actually got it into the customer, made the customer happy, made the customer ship, and fixed their problems. So this nature, relation, working with the customer and on their terms, and necessarily in their language, is critical to understand and to make happen. And this leads to successful both marketing and products. I think, I think when you're talking about and dealing with China, you also need to be aware that that market is changing very, very rapidly. Um, there was a time when um, eating out at Pizza Hut or KFC was considered an upscale move for the family to go. Still isn't Shanghai. Those were the days. Those were the days when the house was not heated, not comfortable, and going to the pizza hut was considered a symbol of, uh, of you know, upscaleness. Then there was a, uh, for one point, at one time, a real um, hot selling fast food called California Beef Noodle House. <laughs> and it was owned by a Taiwanese couple. And everybody loved that, it's for a simple, for a reasonable price, you can get a nice bowl of beef noodle in the soup. And whenever I'm going there, they would ask me, what's it like in California? And, and I had to tell them, we don't have California beef noodle house in California. <laughs> that, that too is marketing. But you know, that was, that was a fad for a few years today. There's lots of beef noodle houses, but you don't see California noodle house in China anymore. Something to keep in mind. Hundred NT in Taiwan is your best beef noodle. <laughs> if you pay more than that, you're paying too much. So if Intel is on one side of the spectrum, a startup is on the other side of the spectrum. So there's a big difference how big companies have resources and can do things while startups they're just working in the bootstrap mode. So uh, being a, a young salesman in a, in a young startup, selling internationally and having barely a budget to travel, I actually had to learn you know, on my own in, you know, way how to do business in Spain, France, or Germany. And what I was basically doing, I was just watching the, my partners and my distributors how they do business. So for example, in France, you know, we went for dinner with a client and the distributor told me don't mention anything about business during dinner so we sit there for about four or five hours for dinner that's not a, an american thing right so you don't just come and eat and you leave you just it's a it's a whole you know uh, event and no words was mentioned about business the next day the distributor calls me and said the deal is done so you learn how to do 
it's, and coming from a country where it's a basically go get it, you no know, BS, it was very difficult for me because you know there are no there were no resources, no marketing resources. And actually, one of the funniest story is that in startups, the founders and most of the staff are engineers, so they have no marketing, you know, knowledge or even desire. So they name a product, and I was mainly with data communication and telecommunication startups, and one of the products that we developed was, a, was routers, a router line. And they named one of the routers, it was a very tiny, small router, they named it the Pico router. Not knowing what it means in Spanish. So you can imagine how embarrassing it was for our sales guys in South America going and selling the Pico router. I love this. I love this story. I, I just a quick. Am I on? Yeah, I guess I am. A quick plug that uh, you know, high context, low context countries, and, and one of the things I talk about in, in the, my book on culture is exactly what you story you were just giving, is knowing whether you have to get into the relationship before you talk business versus talking business first. Can I just make a comment about yeah. this? Um, cross-cultural uh, issues that you face when you're opening up in another country. And how do you, it's very nuanced because while on one hand you want to respect and honor and appreciate the cultural differences, on the other hand, in our case, we pride ourselves on customer service. It's one of the things that differentiates us from our one competitor. Going into another country where their, their uh, practices of customer service did not meet our standards. So how do you hire people? How do you train them? How do you accommodate the cultural differences while not sacrificing your own customer service standards and potentially really impacting your brand? And what we ended up doing was actually using US staff on different hours, right? We added shifts to our US office. We supplemented the service that was being provided by the, in this case, the UK staff with US people who could expedite things, who understood the nature of what we were delivering. And in that way, we helped them in the foreign office, but we didn't sacrifice what we needed to deliver in terms of customer you service. You also role modeled for them. Yes, yes. We tried to train, wasn't always necessarily possible to get that. It's just a cultural difference. Yeah. So while you have the mic, I'm sorry, Bruce, did you want to add? No, I was, I was just going to add a little bit to what Michael and, and Avi said from a standpoint of uh, Michael was talking about development, but you also frequently have had a fair amount of experience where you've got a US based company and there may be marketing or development people, uh, business development people in that country. And they sometimes get slammed with just the marketing from the US and that can have problems or you let them run amok and then you've got the problem of they've done their own thing and it's, it's not connected. And so I've always tried to teach them to talk in terms of how they improve the customer. And that's a universal language that they can talk about. It's, yes, you expect that the staff in that country you know, is culturally sensitive, either they're natives or, or have, uh, have learned that. But to be able to talk back to the US in terms of how do they improve the customer, it gets away from this type of campaign works or that campaign. And it's a universal language that really brings everything together. You do that on the development side, but you can do that also on the sales and marketing side. So as long as you have the mic, I have a question oh. for you, Bruce. So one of the things I notice, and I bet a lot of you notice it too, is you're watching television and you see a TV commercial that was obviously produced by somebody from another country. And, it, and it's meant to be funny, but it's actually insulting. You know, it, it kind of crosses a line it shouldn't cross. When you're dealing with, with customers, how do you deal with um, modulating those kinds of things? Sure. Uh, most of the time I'm dealing with clients, there's a, there's a buffer. I'm dealing with my clients and they're dealing with their, their, uh, their customers. Uh, there may be cases where I'm talking directly from a, a standpoint of trying to draw out some insights. Um, you, once again, I s try to stay really close to how is the service or the product, how does it improve their business? 
And so it's not a matter of how do we project out our great knowledge. It's, it's a very, I'm mean, going to try to take a very humble approach. And if you are truly, Avi and I were talking, we talked a lot in the, in the, in the lobby before, about relationships. And if you actually build a, 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 a legitimate relationship with people where they feel you care about them, you can get excused for some things, whereas if you're just there to sell them something, they're going to hold you to a different standard. So I think there's a humbleness that cuts across a lot of societies, a lot of cultures, that if you're genuine about what you're trying to do and you're trying to learn from them as opposed to tell them what they should know, uh, people will help you. And that's here, that's there, that's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I want to add something that I haven't heard uh, that I personally had to experience, which is that how, um, particularly in marketing, how technology tools are now being used and how they're different in cultures. I'll give you two examples. There's a company in the UK that I know pretty well. Um, they were, got it, they, it was a small little company um, and another partner came in and she used Facebook back then before Facebook was actually charging to use it and brought the company from selling a few thousand to in, in the, making a, a, a few thousand pounds a year to making a, several hundred thousand pounds a year, basically by, with no marketing budget, by utilizing social media and by utilizing the resources you can find in Europe and UK, which is in Europe and the UK, they have areas where you're allowed to hold meetings. You don't need a contract. You don't need, you don't need a to pay for that, but you can just you know, do a show and tell uh, Trafalgar Square in, in London is a good example that you can show and talk to people. Uh, you don't have to pay anything as long as you, you, you follow the rules. The old soapbox. Yeah, yeah, the old soapbox. You know, the old soapbox brought from a couple thousand pounds a year to several hundred thousand pounds a year. And the company is growing. But that's in Europe. In China, the, the, the way to reach out to people through technology is WeChat. Everything is done in WeChat. You have marketing in WeChat, you rent your bike with WeChat, you pay the taxi with WeChat, and of course Alipay is trying to catch up, but you know, WeChat is the king right there. But that's an example of in, in one group, one technology, if you use FaceTime in China, it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry about that. But you can use WeChat. You, you have to and technology is a way, a critical way of doing marketing. So, so one, one thing you have to deal with in multiple cultures is what technology does that culture use? Yeah. Even if it works there, China things don't work, but even if it works there, what is the one, you know? You want to talk to somebody in Taiwan, you use Line. You want to talk to somebody in Europe, you use WhatsApp. You want to talk to somebody in China, you use WeChat. If you don't have them all on your phone, you're not talking to your customer base. Well, you need to go to where your customers are. Right. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it works in one place. If your customers in the other place aren't there, it doesn't matter. Right. I have a quick, quick comment and observation. Bruce was talking about how do you tell your customer what a great product you have? And I find, especially in China, you don't spend any effort or time saying how great my product is. What you really want is testimonials. Get third party, especially reputable third parties, to say what a great product you have. That really counts. That's because you're biased, George, and they know you're biased, but, but you know, Arlene, well, Arlene I, isn't biased because she's a customer. I've got Jack Ma supporting my conference uh, next year, so this is, a, this is a way to do it, and that is exactly correct. By, having an activity where you have five names that everybody knows. And all they have to say is, we think it's a neat idea. They don't have to say very much. Crossing the chasm. Nothing is as easy, quote unquote, marketing as Intel inside. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good That was the concept. greatest. That was totally the greatest. Did you want to add something to it? You know, I would just add that the um, one thing we found going into another country, regardless of what the technology tools are, the mentality around responding to technology and to marketing techniques may be very different. So we had to take our, our I went back maybe 10, 15 years to the marketing we did 15 years ago in the US and moved it overseas because 
they weren't where we were yet in terms of marketing this specific service. Might be different with another service, but with this specific service, they were used to doing it a certain way, getting it from a certain source, and having it be a real problem to manage and deal with. So I had to go back to what we used to do 15 years ago, educating our US customers, because I had to meet the customer where they were at, just because technologically they were just advanced, and maybe in some cases more advanced, emotionally and psychologically, they were much further behind us, and then we just bring them up to where we are now. I just wanted to add one more thing is back in the day, many years ago, we had basically first brochure of a product in English and then you go to France, you translate it into French, you go to Spain or to Germany, you translate it to the same languages. But what we found out is that you can't just take a brochure or a data sheet and translate it like a Google translator does because, <laughs> because the same thing would be will be described differently in France and completely in a different way in Germany. So it's not enough just to know how to translate something from one language to the other, but also to know the culture and to know how things are expressed. And that plays a major... I have an example for you. There's a new movie that's out called Crazy Rich Asians. Oh which I'm sure everybody's it's heard a about. wonderful movie. In, in that movie, they use a Madonna song, um, The Material Girl. But if you look at the translation, it's sung in Chinese. If you look at the translation from Chinese to English, it is nothing like the words that Madonna used at all. In fact, it's culturally more appropriate for China than it is, or for Asians, than it is for, for um, Americans. It's crazy rich Asian, by the way. Was that? It fell flat in China. <laughs> <laughs> they say, all Asian cast, so what? <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> that it, makes perfectly it, good sense. It's <laughs> very funny. In mainland China, you're correct that hardly anybody's heard about it. But all the rest of Asia think it's fantastic. So, <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I have a question I'd like you to, to, to start with, and then everybody else can chime in. Um, what creative or disruptive ideas did you use to get access to an international market, especially since you're self-defined as a small business? So, what we did was to, and, and this is kind of the boring part, um, we researched very deeply what we could do and what we couldn't do from a regulatory perspective. Um, we looked at who we could partner with, where we could acquire through partnership what, what we needed to operate there, and then what we could bring to the partnership that they didn't already have. By doing that, we, we found a loophole in a sense, um, and we exploited that loophole. So nobody else had thought about that an outside company from a foreign country could come in and sell this service in, their, in, in a foreign country. But there was nothing from a, a legal or regulatory perspective that prevented it. It's just that the entity within that country that had been in control of it was very upset and still is very upset. Because we came in, we brought in better service, better pricing, we did it legally but we did, we disrupted the whole market to the point where they tried to, they, they made motions that they were trying to get us out of the marketplace, but because we did it with a lot of research and a lot of knowledge and we consulted with attorneys in that country and we consulted with other professionals to make sure that we were in, we were within our rights to do it, we've been able to go in and disrupt that whole market, both from a customer service and a pricing perspective. That's an incredible story. Avi, how did you in Israel? Well, again, spending most of my career in startup environment, um, you just go and do it, right? You just call, call, and you, you do the hard work, and you find someone that is willing to sell your product or to work with you. Um, but one of the things that, uh, still being in Israel, uh, one of the things that I did, which led actually to the acquisition of the startup that I worked for, 
was basically um, showing uh, the potential client how they would use our product in their product. So the same Pico router that I mentioned, basically I led to uh, develop a solution that will show them how they will use that in their cable modem, which basically when they saw it, they just fell in love with it and they acquired the company. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? Well, I think, I think in the case of China, if, That's you're a, country. if you're an HP or a 3M, companies like that, Intel, um, 3M and, and, um, and uh, HP were clients of mine, you go in at the national level. You go and talk to the ministry and you shake all the hands at, uh, at the uh, highest level. If you're a small business, you want to find the market and start at the local level, at the city that you want to begin with, look for partners, look for help, and introduce at one city at a time. There are some challenges. For example, another small company I know, Google, has been very challenged to get into the, into the China market, um, in part because of Alibaba but, um, and Baidu. But, but I, I, you know, I was just in Beijing, and Google is now establishing a primary office in Beijing, actually right near the Intel office. Uh, and, um, and so they've finally broken through the iceberg. Well, now, how much they can break through, we'll see. No, Lee, Lee Kai Fu is a personal friend of mine. So I know the inside story on why Google did not succeed initially. It seems like one of the founders insists that China has to be a democracy. <laughs> Anybody else on this? Okay. So my next question are, is what are some of the other critical issues, things that you need to think about, um, such as the difference in contract negotiation? I mean, I know from having taught international business that in some, in some countries it's just a one paragraph agreement and in the United States it's 4,000 pages. You know, those differences. Um, operations, you were talking about the difference in standards. And then also things like gifts and bribes. Um, I recently was with a group of, of Chinese that were here and um, among the other things that I did is I brought them over to our um, city council and had the mayor speak to them and things like that. And the, this Chinese delegation had a gift, and it was a significant gift, not just a tiny little token, that, he, that they gave to each of us. Uh, it didn't rise to the standard of a bribe. It wasn't that big a gift. But nonetheless, uh, it wasn't something we were expecting, and certainly we weren't ready to reciprocate. So you have all those little kinds of difference, some big, some little. How do you handle all those? Who wants to take that? I, I can George. give you an example. We, when I was on the board of um, Las Vegas Sands, we were considering a site in Spain. And we went to a uh, location outside of Madrid, and they gave us a very impressive um, presentation. The first time I've seen aerial photography taken from a drone, wow. and they did that. And in order to help us remember that, they gave us each a, um, a uh, not an <laughs> iPad, not a, not a drone, but <laughs> it, what, what's the Microsoft equivalent to an iPad? Surface? Surface. Surface. They gave us each one a surface. Wow. OK. So what did we do? We very politely tell them that it's against US laws and regulations to accept a gift like that. And that explanation, by the way, gets around a lot of problems in these countries, not only in receiving a gift, but also whether, when they're having an expectation with a handout. You can, say, you can explain, we can't do that. It's against, we go to jail for that. Well, bra uh, gifts in China are the thing to do. I mean, they, they don't usually give you a surface. That's pretty high end. Uh, they pay for my airfare, business class, to come give a talk in Wusi and gave me a high-end um, place to stay, plus diplomatic service the whole way. But We're not doing that for you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but, you're, but, you're in the FBI and CIA files. <laughs> yeah, 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 I've been there for years. Uh, uh, it, 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 anyway, um, but um, 
Uh, the bribing aspect in the technology field, I see a lot. Gifts, gifts are reduced to expense, which, you, which is okay. And look, even if it's high end, you know, high class, uh, or simple things, you know, the most common gifts is cha, and you get tea, you know, or associated uh, biscuits that go with, go with the tea, or a scarf, you know, if you're female. Um, but, you know, this is very, very common to do, and doing the exchange is, is, is quite common. Um, I-N gifts are, are seen less and less. Bribing at the local level, you still see in the smaller uh, second tier, third tier cities. Um, but in the main cities, it's not as observable, um, at least that in my experience. In the technology area, it's not as observable. Um, uh, what it goes on under the table in Chinese is, may be different. But, um, but yes, a big gifting I've seen slow down, but they find ways to spend the money that fits in the law, like buying your business class tickets and putting you in a very high-end suite and taking care of all. So that interaction is still there, and you need to give it the right respect. Yes, you can, if it's too high-end, you can say, you know, it's against American law, blah, blah, blah. They don't actually want to hear that. They want you to be pleased. And if you're pleased and you do good business with them, then you build a good relationship. And I said from the very beginning, in dealing with, particularly with China, relationship is more critical than almost anything else. There are other countries in the world. Anybody want to tackle <laughs> some of the other countries? I would just add that working mainly in Europe, it's a little bit different than Asia. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's not that it doesn't exist. It exists, but different on a diff in, in different level, right? So for example, that could be maybe something like inviting um, a group of decision makers to a seminar over, you know, in Israel, right? So we pay for the flight tickets, for accommodation, things like that. So it's, it's a little bit different, but you can still consider that as part of, of the same process. In, in Europe, they give you much better quality wine in, <laughs> instead of having this tea, which has got a house full of it. What about, con I'm sorry, go ahead, Liz. Um, well, I, I would just say as a small business that um, you're much less likely to run into it in, in many cases because you don't have as much at stake. They're, they don't see it as, as important. Um, but one of the things that we try to make clear is it's one thing if you're the, the principal and the decision maker and you're the one that has all those international contacts, but once you start having your employees um, going out there and executing business for you and even potentially doing <clears throat> bids on uh, government contracts, for instance, it's pretty important to have a compliance policy in place um, in order to make sure that you as a business owner don't get involved in something that you didn't condone, but because of the sales incentive, potentially, or business development incentive for one of your employees, um, probably a pretty senior person, that you may get dragged into something that you didn't really intend to. It's or you like might a, end up in jail in Canada. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a no tips policy. So come back to, I, I know I threw a lot of things into that one question, but what about contract negotiations? I know that there's vast differences in expectations about what needs to be in a contract. Um, uh, with us, I think our lawyers get paid by the word, so everything is, you know, as wordy as humanly possible. Well, uh, as you stated earlier, years ago, it used to just kind of be, let's, let's shake hands on it, and particularly in Asia. Um, and in America, you know, every year there seems to be an exponential increase in the number of pages and the associated non-legible wording that comes into contracts. But that's actually changing. Uh, contracts in, in Europe are pretty much the same as the States. They're just as obnoxious. And um, now contracts in China, the, the, there's a particular focus on trying to control intellectual property and dealing with the Chinese. And um, so that has actually expanded the nature of what's in the contract, uh, or of contracts I've seen. So, you have to have lawyers for every, for every region. Unfortunately, the bigger you get, the more lawyers you need. That seems to be a, 
a well-known equation. It's a good job. You can always get money as a lawyer. I, I would just say make sure you're working with someone who has that local perspective. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that you trust and, and is aware, not your, your colleague that has gone to China a couple of times or gone to Germany, uh, but someone who knows not just the, the perspective but how it's changing. Because usually the contract you're writing for is for today and for the future, not for today and the past. I think the make, main, main difference in perspective is that an American lawyer thinks about all the things that could go wrong and therefore must be provided for and written and cover in a contract. In the old days, in, from the China's perspective, they don't, they don't think about any of the things that could go wrong because basically if something goes wrong, we'll negotiate and discuss uh, at that time. But unfortunately, they are more and more under the American lawyer's influence. So, <laughs> so the, the contracts are getting longer and longer and longer. And any of us that are in an intermediary position having to explain every clause in the contract, it's a killer. So I went to a conference many, many years ago about lawyers. And I forget the exact what the, the theme was. But the, one of the lawyers explained the purpose of a contract is not for when things go well, it's for when things go poorly and how do you disengage. And I thought that was a really great way to look at, look at contracts is not to make someone do something, but if they're not gonna do it, what are the consequences? How do you cope with it? Yeah, that's very realistic. Um, I would just add that the, you may be going into another country in Di uh, different ways. So one way you might go in is you might acquire another company, small or large, but let's say you're going to acquire a company that has an established presence there. Um, in that contract negotiation, for instance, and I know this not because I've personally experienced it, but because I have a lot of colleagues in the Organization of Women in International Trade here in Silicon Valley who are international trade compliance professionals, and they focus often on what's going on in their mergers and acquisitions departments and whether or not the, the entity to be acquired actually is in compliance with the laws of the country they're acquiring it in, and also there are gonna be US laws that they have to be in compliance with. So if you're in the position of acquiring an entity or going into a partnership with, a, with an entity in another country, you wanna make sure that what you're acquiring is actually in compliance or you're inheriting a whole lot of headaches that you may not have bargained for. Good point, thank you. What's the difference in, in marketing services as opposed to marketing products? I mean, the real short answer is that there's more and more service and products today than there, there were. And it's, you know, so from that standpoint, the product does something. And if it's a component into some other product, they may, you may see it a little bit differently than if it's a product that people are using. But what does it do? I mean, people don't buy products, they buy something that does something for them. Well, it, actually, the connection is so gray. If you're a component, you need to continue to service that component because it comes with things like, in the case of computers, it comes with BIOS, BIOS gets bugs, or there are changes in the system that have to force the change in there. So in point of fact, the service model continues all the way up the ecosystem, uh, not just from free product launch, but after the product is out the door. Uh, so yeah. how much different they are is, is, from my perspective, not that radically different. But if I were selling, excuse me, if I were selling a chair, if I were marketing a chair, um, it'd be real easy to do. A picture of the chair, you know, a little bit about it, it'll hold a couple of hundred pounds in weight, et cetera. But if I was marketing Bruce's uh, marketing services, that's a whole different story. Well, you want to sell a commodity or you want to sell the, the value add to it? So I would say even with the chair, do you want to sell against all the other chairs? Or are you selling you know, a, a, an ability to sit comfortably, at, whether you're dining or reading a book? Or, I mean, there's lots of different ways you would use that. And why would I value your chair versus some other chair? I mean, maybe if I'm putting in, in a conference room, I don't really care. I just need chairs. But if I'm going to sit there and that's my chair to read in every night, I'm gonna take a very different view. And so you need to understand that it's not just a chair. 
Well, um, you, you've got to think about the product too, because yeah. um, you know you can go to Sunjun and you can buy a tablet for 100, 100 RMB, which is about twenty bucks, um, and you know it comes with no service. Uh, they work. Sometimes they work for six months. Sometimes they work for a couple of years. And when they break, you throw them in the garbage. That is one sales model, which means that you buy an object. It can be a Rolex watch. You pay 100 RMB for It can be a tablet. It's pay 100 RMB. You, you can pay 500 RMB for the same watch if you That's don't negotiate well. the old GE well, model. Well, <laughs> culture, culturally, it's, it's historically and culturally difficult to convince an Asian to buy services. They don't believe in buying service. They expect the services to come with the product. So that's undergoing a attitudinal change because they're beginning to recognize more and more and more that um, the software is perhaps even more important than the hardware. But that was not always, not always the case. And. Um, I think one of the best examples was Autodesk. Autodesk has this um, mechanical design program that was so popular and not a single copy was bought in China. So the country manager at one point, a brilliant country manager, looked at the Autodesk program that's already in there that's been still not, not bought. He treated it as a install base. And then he introduced a software program for building design and this was just at the point when China was starting their building boom and they understood immediately that if they just steal that copy of a, a building design they wouldn't know what to do with it they have to have a manual they have to have a training so that copy really did sell well in China no you're bringing up the how to manage the intellectual property aspect over yeah, and over right. and, which is which is a, a very big challenge in fact uh, they're got, both at Stanford and San Jose State here, they have a lot of faculty that are studying exactly that problem. Uh, how, how, to, how, to, how to do business in areas where you don't have the same level of intellectual property control that we in theory have here in the United States, in theory. Not so, in so just to add to that, some, in going back to your example of a chair, because not everything is software and hardware that requires maintenance and upgrades and updates and things like that. You're behind but time. <laughs> everything is IoT now. My chair has a sensor in it to tell me whether or not I need to lose weight or to tell me whether or not I need my next meeting on time. This is and Goldilocks right, right. So, that, so that changes. Huh? But there is a difference between selling a chair, which might be a one-time transaction, yes. and I may not see that customer yes. again, versus leasing the chair, and now we are tied forever, basically. That's true. It's an important chair point. Chair as a service. Yeah. Ch chair as chair a service, service right. yeah. Precisely. Well, and, and the, from a trade facilitation perspective, which is often how I look at things, mm -hmm. there's a big difference between selling a chair and selling the, and, and marketing it as a lease, because, Number one, you have to worry about your supply chain and delivery times and, and your costs of getting that product through customs and all the permitting process and the regulatory issues if you've got, um, you know, uh, let's say you've got beauty products, for instance, and you're going to sell them into another country where there's, you know, health and safety issues or toys, children's toys where there's health and safety issues. Um, that's a whole different thing than if you're selling some sort of a financial service. You're still subject to regulations but you're not necessarily subject to regulations that apply to the transit, the shipping of those goods. And so you've got a promise that you're making to your foreign customer, for instance, that something's going to be there on time. Not difficult to do if you're selling a service, but a lot more difficult to do if you're selling a product because it's out of your control in many cases. So there's you know, that, that big difference in terms of product and service. Thanks. What did you uh, find to be the most challenging aspect of finding the blend that works for many countries, many cultures, rather than looking at each of them, you know, totally discreetly? How did you blend it? I, You're all looking at each other. I, you know, <laughs> Anybody want to tackle this one? I, I, okay, a blend. So um, that would mean what what 
what criteria went across cultures as opposed to the speci going into each specific market? Well, one of the things you could do, obviously, in China, you can use red. In Israel, you could use blue. Uh, in Ireland, you could use green, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or y you could somehow create a okay, rainbow. Okay, okay, yeah. I got the answer for you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You, you just, okay, so. When we first started our business, we were called Corporation for International Business. We did the same thing we're doing now, but there was a reason why we were Corporation for International Business. Over the years, and we sold this product service called an ATA Carnet. ATA Carnet is a word that, a phrase that doesn't exist in English. ATA is an acronym meaning admission, temporary, temporary admission, and carne is a French word meaning voyage or passage. Nobody in the United States really knew what it was, and many people still don't. So we're trying to sell this thing. We played around with a merchandise passport, and we're trying to think of what, it, what can we come up with for a name or a brand name for, the, for this product that would resonate with a lot of different cultures and also would put a picture in people's minds. So everybody knows what's the, the, the hallmark of a boomerang, it goes out and comes back. And of course that's the hallmark of the service that we offer. Every single thing that goes out on an ATA Carnet document is supposed to come back. We also found as we were researching and trying to figure out what the next step was, um, in this kind of rebranding process that the word boomerang is not spelled the same in every language but is the same in every language. So anywhere we were going to market the word or the term boomerang carne, it, when we first transitioned we were boomerang freight solutions. That didn't work very well for a while. We finally went to boomerang carnes. So we found something that would work across all cultures, even though when we deliver that service into those different countries, we would deliver it differently and market it differently. Thank you. Well, we have an interesting thing going on, in, in, not in Intel, but in my new company, um, the, the Clinic AI company. And the, we have a medical solution. In, rea in this medical solution, technical medical solution, and it's people-based. It doesn't make any difference what culture you're from. However, how you want to relate it to different cultures, but particularly in Asia versus America, where Europe and America have pretty much the same medical thinking. But in Asia, you have Western medicine and Eastern medicine, and you want your audience to appeal to both. So how you market that is one thing, one challenge that we're, we're looking at now because we want to relate to the community who think Eastern medicine, but here this is a Western medicine, actually technology-based analytics tool, and you don't want to explain these terminologies. You, you, want, you want to get it back to the acupuncture days and get away from uh, traditional Western medicine. We haven't solved that problem yet. We're just, we're just breaking it because we're just starting this company that working on the technology end first, and the marketing we next. I think basically, uh, Arlene, your question is really antithetical to what we've been talking about, <laughs> which, re which is that you need to customize according to the countries that you serve. So I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all approach. I mean, Leslie's, Leslie's approach, for example, is particularly effective, I think, in Australia, but maybe not as effective anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll echo that, that from a standpoint of yeah, you took, used the example of colors, pretty superficial. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> but, but you really do, you want, to, and, but from a standpoint of development maybe, you want to try to develop products that can then have the right skin put on them so that they're customized to a particular audience as opposed to developing a standalone product for every market. So what can you do that, that draws, that's common, that goes, that cuts across? And that's going to come down probably, you know, to deeply to how do you, you know, not what does it do, but what does it allow other people to do? Then you can talk about it in the way that, that their particular country or audience talks about it. Let me give you another, uh, another example of how different advertising uh, 
And if you've ever noticed, if you're selling a product where you're expecting, product or service, where you're expecting a large Hispanic population to be your customer, you always see family and music. Always. Um, that's not necessarily true when you're marketing to other uh, cultures. So, it, you know, somehow, you know, in the textbook that guides all marketeers, it's, you know, the Mexican culture reveres family and music. Um, so you've got those kind of challenges. But I think what you're saying overall, I think you're basically saying that, you know, it, the challenge is to stay compatible. Just to add to that, if you're a small business or a startup, you don't think about going so much across so many yeah. different markets. You just focus on a market, on one market, and you try to be successful in that versus to try to go and conquer the world. And that's why that issue may not be there. You start with a market where you have the knowledge, you know what to do, you know how to market, and that's how you take it from there. That's, yeah, it's a good strategy. Um, my next question is, what's my next question? What's the single most important factor ensuring success when marketing overseas? So one of your questions? <laughs> Go on, Leslie. Go on. Um, Leslie gave me some great questions. I would say having a big customer to start. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's probably I mean, true. Just, let's just drill down to one of the biggest factors in our success was before we actually launched, we went to the UK corollary to our, a US customer and we had the referral of the US customer to uh, this UK, I, I don't, yeah, so it's BBC. So we went to BBC in the UK, and you'll recognize that name obviously, so it'll mean something. BBC in the UK sends dozens, maybe hundreds of production kits overseas every month to capture news. And they need this document, this ATA carnet, so they can get their production kits into foreign countries and back without paying duty and tax. So we went to BBC and said, you know, we're going to do it bigger, better, cheaper. Um, and we're able to get that customer before we even started the business. And I would say, if you can do that, you will sleep so much better um, because you'll have that that revenue coming in, obviously, to help to first help absorb some of those startup costs. It also gives you some breathing room while you're marketing to other customers that you may not have that kind of relationship with off the bat. But I would say look at how can you grab or capture through, either through partnership or a relationship um, that might be shared between the U.S. and the foreign country that you're going into and see if you can, can get those customers or a big customer right up front and then you can breathe. I'll go real old school on that, and that doesn't have to be across the country. I mean, that's advice that if I had, across a, neighbors. I, I had a commercial contractor that was established in the Bay Area, and they were going to Sacramento. Absolutely. And so they were going to open the office, they were going to have staff, they were going to have costs, but they wanted to have a successful customer there first. Right. And so whether you're going to the UK or whether you're going to Sacramento, the advice is the same. Yeah, yeah similar. I want to point that you made, you made a very good point. You know. Building the relationship is extremely critical. Extremely critical, um, and um, and 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 getting that first customer base may not be one customer. Maybe just that base is also a critical relationship. But I haven't heard one thing. Uh, I haven't heard a discussion about funding. Um, the nature of funding for you're, you're trying to move into a country. In addition to sales money, you may have to need some startup money. And the rules and the way of getting that money is different, particularly in China, than it is in other countries. Actually, there's an opportunities in China right now that the government is putting a lot of money into bring international countries into companies into do business in China. And, um, so there are opportunities, but but the, I think that's one area that you have to consider, particularly if you're a small company. Uh, Yes, you can get in there by sales, that's avenue number one, but another avenue is finding alternative financing to grow your start and uh, using both government and business relationships to do that. 
So just going back to the basic definition of sales is to find what somebody wants, needs, or desire and show them how to get it. Yeah. So it's one of the basic keys to success is whether you go to Sacramento or you go to the UK or to China is to find what is needed, desired, or required and find a solution for that. Coming from, again, from, from startups which are usually engineering companies, the engineers usually decided what they think the world needs. And now they were trying right. to go out and convince the world that they need that. Yeah, yeah. Versus find first what do they need and then go back to the lab and develop that. So yeah. that could, that's something that could really help to succeed. Well, <laughs> need is an interesting word. I wonder whether people actually need Teslas or not. But they're very popular. <laughs> China and America. There, there is a. Uh, when you need one. <laughs> increasingly, there is a, a low cost alternative that hasn't been available in the past, and that's do your marketing through the web. Do your website, make sure it's being shown all over in China and elsewhere. And there you can take some risks. You can show products that you don't know if there's a, if there's a market or not and just test it out and see see how many pings you get. The interesting thing is that um, the market in China used to be like we have on American television now, buy it cheap. You know, cheap is the critical issue. But with the wealth in China changing, you know, people want official, not cheap. They don't want the copy purse anymore. They want the real thing. Not the $100 Rosa. Oh, yeah, 100 renminbi, not dollar, big difference. Um, uh, they actually want the $10,000 Rolex, um, you know, one like Roger Federer wears. So, so, so uh, in, in fact, that market is changing. And that's another thing that wasn't brought up here is the fact that over time, as economies change, markets change too, and it's in, critical to keep your business one step ahead of where that market is changing so you can align. Maybe one day you would sell an Atom chip and say it's cheap, and the next day you sell an Exxon server and say it does all this computational power, your artificial intelligence, and everything else. That type of, even though you have both products, how you approach the market is going to be different how the economies are changing. There's another... Um thing we don't often think of in term, especially for small business, but even for larger companies, the U.S. government has a lot of help through the Department of Commerce when you want to go into a foreign country. So if you don't have all this funding behind you, but, you know, in our case, we were doing, we were self-funding it, but if you don't have a lot of funding behind you and you need feet on the ground in that foreign country, you've identified, okay, you've had a lot of inquiries from X country and it looks like it might be a good place for your product or service, contract with the Department of Commerce, extremely affordable to have them use their feet on the ground in that foreign country, their gold key service for instance, and they have a phenomenal office right here, right here in San Jose, um, and they have one in San Francisco as well and even in Oakland. So they're very accessible to us here in Silicon Valley and they can really help especially companies that are export ready to make that that leap into exporting into a foreign country. Thank That's a good point except they're all closed right now. Com well, yeah, we're not going to talk about that. Our current finance situation. <laughs> they're There's one more up. point that you That's a good point. There's one more point is that in the case of technology there are a lot of uh, research oriented type of funding both in America, uh, through the different foundations, and, uh, and both business foundations and government, and in overseas, that they want to grow technology, so you, they'll fund your technology development before you're really ready for market. I think Leslie made an excellent point to go under the umbrella of the Department of Commerce and many of these missions abroad. One additional thing, besides leveraging on, on the the U.S. government mission is that being part of it as additional cachet to your company. Like, oh, they're part of the U.S. government mission. They must be legit. Must be There's legit. that psychology to it. Third party. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just went. No, I just said that's the, the power of a third party. Yes, yeah. 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 So I want to do, I have one more last question that I want to ask the panel. 
And then I, I'd like to give the audience uh, a minute or two to ask any questions that they might have. Uh, but before everybody runs away, I want to kind of tell you that I, after we've done that, I want to introduce Brandon to you, and give, who's the one that supplied all the drinks, and give him a minute to tell you about what his service is, because it ties in perfectly with what the panel's doing. And then after that, we'll officially close it and, and invite you to stay and to network. But let me ask my last question of the panel, and then we'll move in that direction. Uh, so my last question, and, and it ties in what, what you just suggested, Leslie. Uh, what can we here at the Santa Clara Chamber of Commerce, particularly our group, the International Economic Development Group, uh, do to make it easier for you and for newcomers uh, in the marketing field, the business field, to be effective marketing and selling across cu uh, cu blah, 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 cultures? So I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So one thing is um, provide education and maybe seminars. There is a lot of knowledge and talent within the chamber itself with members in all kinds of areas yes, and, you know. and categories and industries. And it's a wealth of knowledge and information that we can actually provide and make available to, to the public. And secondly is maybe um, create an entire relationships with international organizations in other markets, in other countries, and that will allow our you know, members to utilize those resources to go abroad. Notice Nick taking notes. Let, let me uh, put in a plug here. Um, as I was retiring from Intel, I started an IEEE group with the focus of, uh, I, uh, for those who are not familiar with the IEEE, it's an international organization, approximately 500,000 members um, were worldwide, and um, uh, we're all about engineering, engineering technology, computer science, and where those are all being used. And um, most of the, the, the sub, it's broken into subgroups, and these subgroups are often called societies. So there's one on computers, there's one on communications, there's one on industrial electronics, you know, different, one on nuclear medicine. Um, but I started one which is called the Technology and Engineering Management Society, and its focus is helping businesses and individuals be innovate and get products out the door, get entrepreneurs started. So in point of fact, having a Chamber of Commerce work with IEEE groups in fact, the one here in Silicon Valley is the largest in the world, um, I mean the local one. It gives you both local reach and international reach. So it gives you the opportunity to get speakers, not just locally, but ones that are actually in China trying to work with America or in Europe trying to work with America. And they often come here for business and that time window they're here, they could interact with the chamber as well. So building a relationship between the local chamber and a, group, a international nonprofit group like IEEE would be a potential benefit to both parties. Thank you for that, Nick. That'd be a great idea. So I'll give a plug to Nick um, because a few years ago he reached out to WITNC, which is the Organization of Women in International Trade in Northern California, which is not at all just about women. We have men and women members in equal numbers as well as corporations. And um, Nick was trying to give the Santa Clara Chamber members an additional resource for international trade knowledge. And um, so we have this relationship. It's very similar to what you just suggested. It's, it's a different type of international trade knowledge. It goes across commodities and it primarily has to do with compliance and how do you make sure that you're market ready in terms of, of compliance issues. But one of the main objectives of this trade organization, it's a not-for-profit, not first of all, it's international. So if you're a member, you have contacts in different countries and, and people in different industries that you can make connections with. But also, because the networking piece of it here, you've heard a lot of general information, but if you're going to get down, drill down to the specifics for your particular business, you need to be talking to people who can really give you direct advice about your specific situation. 
find somebody or somebody's who can mentor you, who is willing to help you. They do this with the um, District Export Council here in Northern California. WIT NC does it. Maybe the Chamber has a version of, of mentoring companies, specifically in the international trade space, but then enhance it with these other nonprofit affiliations that could help you with your businesses. A variation on that theme would be for the chamber to organize a mission into China. And that's, a, that's not as simple as I just make it. It's, there's quite a bit into it. So we need to have a separate conversation, but somebody like Diana Ding here could, could, could be very easily the advisor to such a mission. Thank you. You know what, I'm looking at the clock and we run out of time. And for those of you that have burning questions, the, the panel will stay for a few minutes after and you can approach them. But I do want to give Brandon a, a minute, not more than, and then I want to officially close but invite you to stay for some more networking and food. Thanks very much. Payment Love was delighted to be a sponsorship, uh, sponsor today and uh, I just really enjoy the panel. It was fantastic. Uh, I can't believe we didn't have more people here. This is a, a world-class panel, so thank you all for coming today and, and participating. Um, you've talked a lot about the trade deficit. You've talked about exporting, and those are all important things, but a lot of small businesses are not in a position where they can actually export. Um, they have things here that they need to sell. And one of the things that Payment Love does is we provide the ability for uh, businesses that are here to take advantage of the $100 million per day that is coming into the United States from China. So specifically with WeChat Pay and Alipay, uh, we, we provide payment solutions so businesses here can accept those forms of payment and be able to make those customers more comfortable in using their everyday transaction method. So, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Um, help me thank the panel. Thank you all.